in terms of where we begin, I think uh, I just would like to take a brief moment to take a look at the market opportunity that we have today. I know that there's many differences in Europe than in the US, but um, we both are, are facing a tremendous amount of trauma as an industry um, from the um, degree of changes that are occurring simultaneously um, here a lot of the forest is coming from government and, and has a big impact in the US. It's obviously very driven by advertising. Um, but there's some similarities with second screen and with um, sort of the, how to handle this transition. As far as um, success stories, uh, uh, when I was speak speaking with the organizers of the conference, they said, you know, let's really focus on everyone's aware of the, tr of the trauma, so let's, let's focus on some solutions. So we're going to go through some smart approaches to innovation, um, things that we've seen work. Um, uh, in the U.S. and also um, just talking about best practices that broadcasters can. Is it okay, the audio? Yep. Yeah. Um, as well as uh, sort of the risk reward ratio. So um, I began in television um, uh, and worked prior to starting Magnet Media at a technology company. So that was obviously an uh, unusual background in some ways. We had a, a very successful startup company that worked in the entertainment industry. And when I launched Magnet Media, it was a very different time. It was in the year 2000, and we were a traditional video production company. Um, and at the same time, because I had recently come from technology, I had a, a lens to um, service all the uh, changes that were just beginning to occur at that time. And you know, obviously, the internet was in its uh, sort of infancy. Um, but today, our, our mission is really to use our talent for storytelling and our, our mastery of technology. And, and everyone in my company is both obsessed with storytelling and, and, and also with technology. And, and we use that, those sort of, uh, sort of joint creative forces to ignite the passion of audiences. So when people ask us, are we an agency? This is not really the, the right category to put my company in. We, we call ourselves a content marketing solutions provider. Um, some people refer to us as a next generation studio. So I know language is important in times of change, and I think that uh, this is um, uh, sort of always evolving. Um, but today we serve, as, as uh, the introduction described, many different um, sort of global brands. Um, and it, this was not always the case. I don't want to come here and say I have the solution because it's really, you know, we are growing today. We've been doubling our company for the last three years every year, and we have currently uh, three dozen openings and, and maybe some international offices in our future. Um, but, uh, you know, so it's been very exciting the last couple of years. But prior to that, I would say, you know, we were facing a lot of the, the very difficult decisions that many of you are facing. Um, you know, how do you possibly cope with all the different new technologies that are coming? How do you make these decisions um, in a way that is um, positioning yourself effectively to take advantage of the opportunity, but doesn't overly diversify your company so that you're diluted and scattered? Um, so this is sort of the topic that I want to talk about today, but I just thought it would be worth capturing when we introduce new employees to my company and we say, you know, they describe what we do and they understand what we do and they look at our website and they're, you know, ready to start and they're anxious. And I say, you know, just to keep in mind this recent historical perspective, it's important to know that, um, you know, changes have occurred very rapidly over the past decade and they're going to continue to occur. So if you're not flexible and adaptable, you know, this is probably not the place for you to work. Um, so when we, when we started, I think that uh, this was a very useful uh, image for me and, and in terms of um, looking at disruptive change, not only in our industry, but in industries in general, um, you know, there's this S-curve pattern that occurs. Um, in some cases, there are multiple decades. In some cases, it's, it's very compressed, as we're seeing. But ultimately, you see uh, dominant parties at the top of the sort of food chain. This is where, obviously, all the market is today. This is today's current market. And yet, there's new companies that are, or new forces that are coming up. And, and in every single industry, you can w look at this if you go to, you know, hear business school professors speak about um, the sort of rapid changes that occur. Um, you know, these um, sort of disruptive changes come into the, the marketplace, and then there's a reshuffling of who's a winner and who's a loser. Um, and it's not to say that traditional media companies cannot also be winners. This is not what the, what the graph is showing, because sometimes they are adopting those digital media companies even within their, their organizations. But ultimately, I think uh, just being aware that the current market dominators, are, it's not a permanent state, um, is, is something that is to keep in mind, because I feel like uh, at least when we were small, one of the um, most frustrating things was, you know, we, we knew that we had some really innovative ideas that customers were responding to um, passionately and were very excited about. We understood that the growth rate of some of these emerging platforms was uh, happening very rapidly. But at the same time, you know, we were, we were, very, we were a five-person 
company when we started and, and you know, that we would go across the street and talk to some of these large corporations and they would look at, at us like we had four heads. Um, so it, it was, uh, you know, I think it's always difficult to be a little bit out ahead of the market, but um, in terms of looking at the patterns over time, um, hopefully this is encouraging to those who are, who are forging the change. Um, so these are not new trends for anyone who's in the industry, right? Co-viewing in the second screen experience, but I think um, just to look at it from a global perspective, um, uh, you know, social networking, number one activity while watching TV, right? It is extremely uncommon in the US today for people to be watching television without having some other device with them. It's, it's now the norm, it's not the exception. Um, and so we work with a lot of the television companies in the US and ultimately um, they, you know, they say, well, should we be focusing on laptop experiences or tablet experiences? Or should we be focusing on you know, mobile devices? Is this, is this a better place for us to put our money? And they ask us in terms of our strategy, what, what would we recommend? Um, and you know, our answer is not an easy one. It's you need to be in all places where the consumer expects you to be. Um, and so we're going to talk about sort of how to manage that, um, that change because that is, I think, one of the most difficult uh, parts about what we're going through together. It's there's not one adoption that is occurring and there's no one model that is working. Um, so to be uh, nimble and to have multiple irons in the fire as opposed to all eggs in one basket, that's one of the themes of my speech today. Um, so in terms of what are we looking at in terms of the, the types of activities people are doing on tablets, um, you know, it's while well, it's sort of ever present, right? They're uh, before they go to bed at night um, with friends and family, waiting, you know, somewhere in line at the grocery store. People are having, having their tablets with them constantly, um, even in the bathroom, which is very upsetting to learn. So, uh, <laughs> but I was uh, I was looking at this with some uh, friends who have children, and they say, you know, how can they possibly be in a classroom and still still consuming if they're not obviously not always educational applications? Um, and the fact is, again, these these changes are are affecting every generation. This is not just a, a specific um, class. If you look at this over um, different generations, um, we work really closely with YouTube, and I was explaining last night at dinner, um, they did a global brand study, and they said, what is, uh, among five-year-olds, what is YouTube's brand sentiment and uh, presence in, among all brands? And among five-year-olds, it's number three, after Cheerios and M&Ms. And when they get to number t age 10, they go to number two because it's, we no longer like Cheerios at age 10. So it's, so it's really, I mean, YouTube is, is, is a massive market presence. And I think this whole idea of having, you know, your television in your pocket, a tablet, a smartphone, obviously the, the mix is a little bit different with smartphones here. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it can't be denied. These are forces that uh, I think we all need to engage with and, and start to um, embrace the reality instead of um, being... Uh, frustrated with the, with the amount of adoption that the technology is, is forcing us to endure. Um, so in terms of consumer engagement, um, this is also something that I thought was pretty interesting. Sort of during the week um, is when a lot of activity for second screen activity occurs. Um, and the other part was, what are they doing when they're tweeting away and, and, and uh, on all these social networks? A lot of times it's sports activity, live events, right? We have award shows um, that are also uh, some of the most popular tweeting and sort of second screen activity commentary. So exchanging information with other viewers is, is one of the second most popular activities. Um, you know, uh, commentary, that, uh, consuming others and retweeting um, sort of funny comments, um, looking at the stars and the hosts, um, re responding to the fans. Um, strangely engaging in the drama, which I thought was, was unusual, and then voting, which of course we all wish was a little higher up on the, <laughs> the percentage here, but thank God they are talking at least a little bit about our politics. Um, so, uh, and, then, and then some other trends as well, besides co-viewing. I mean, I think that what we're looking at is, at least in the US, certainly the death of traditional advertising. This is, you know, never was, in terms of digital platforms, it was never a good experience um, to have banner ads in the margins, right? Everyone's focusing on the, the content itself, and, and yet the advertisers are paying a lot of money, and the publishers are not making a lot of money because of the nature of the marketplace um, in all of these, uh, you know, inferior formats um, called the display ad. Um, but this is where, again, we see the S-curve, this is where all of the large amounts of spend are right now. It's in, it's in pay-per-click advertising with Google and, and with display ads. 
Um, this is migrating incredibly rapidly to video, and this is part of the reason why my company is succeeding right now. It's just a massive, massive shift that's happening in a very compressed period from, from traditional display to video. Um, similarly, we have um, this new category called content marketing. Um, sometimes it's referred to as native advertising. Um, and this does not mean that we are um, opaque um, in terms of the fact that the advertiser is supporting um, the story. In fact, it's, it's very transparent. Um, and so I think that, you know, what, what I thought it would be worth discussing just, just briefly what, why traditional advertising is dying. And I think, you know, we all are familiar with the growth of platforms, but it's interesting to think about how fragmented the audience's attention is. Um, most advertisers are really trying in, in traditional formats to distract the audience from the real reason why they're paying attention, right? It's, it's the, the commercial that you fast forward to or, or you go through, uh, you know, you take a break uh, when it comes on. You're not looking for the advertisement. Um, and so content marketing sort of flips this around and says, what if, we, what if brands could have a voice? What if brands could be producers of original content um, and engage audiences in entertaining ways? Um, and this is, you know, it, it sounds, uh, when we first started our, our, this premise, it, it sort of started, started to sound a little bit fictional. Um, but in the beginning, before there was uh, an impact on video, I think if you look at um, blogs and how some of the most successful web blogs um, and networks were succeeding, brands became publishers. They were engaging with the bloggers on their behalf, again, transparent to the audience, but in a way that was very effective, both for the blogger and for the audience and for the brand. So all three were winning in that world instead of um, the display ad world where all three are losing. Um, similarly, uh, then from publishing, we migrated in 2005, YouTube launched, and everyone's consuming video content on digital platforms. Brands became producers. So most you know, major brands right now have a YouTube channel. Um, most of them are just beginning to figure out what to do with it, but it's, it's uh, you know, sort of in its infancy as far as um, how they can become producers of content. Um, and then most recently, um, th there's this also emergence, obviously, of social networks sort of taking a dominant um, share of voice in terms of the consumer's time and attention. And with that, brands are becoming newsrooms. Um, and so I don't mean that they are reporting on, on uh, you know, serious uh, events and activities necessarily, but I do mean that they are responding to real-time events um, and being forced to respond. In fact, um, there's one example of the Super Bowl, which is a, obviously a l very large um, advertising opportunity in the U.S., the largest. Um, and um, Oreo Cookie spent months putting together a Super Bowl ad um, that, frankly, was not very interesting or creative. Um, and so they spent millions of dollars, and they aired this ad in traditional linear television. Um, and then there was a blackout. No one anticipated this. There was an issue with the, with the game itself, and everyone was you know, stunned and not knowing what to do. Of course, being in, s in the second screen era, everyone's turning to their phones and to Twitter. And so Oreo responds with this very imaginative little Photoshopped ad saying, you can still dunk in the dark uh, <laughs> with a little cookie and no lights. Um, and, and this is now what they'll be known for, a free tweet that took 15 seconds for a graphic designer to put together versus months and months and millions of dollars. This is the industry that we're living in right now. And one is, is surpassing the other for, I think, obvious reasons. Um, connected TV is another obviously incredibly important trend. Um, and so, you know, the potential here is that consumer entertainment is really being inc increasingly consumed. You call it here broadband and, and uh, broadcast. We have connected TV. It's the, it's the same idea, basically, um, you know, ha experiencing television um, as a platform, so knowing that you can experience data um, on the big screen um, as opposed to uh, just having um, a laptop and one device that's connected to the web and the other that's um, only capable of having linear television. Um, and so, you know, consumers are not differentiating between these experiences. And while the adoption of connected TV and the user experience is definitely not there yet, um, I think that uh, companies like Roku and um, Samsung and Apple are really putting tremendous amount of time and energy. Um, and personally, my prediction is once Apple gets serious about this, I think it will become just like with tablets. Um, there were a lot of other sort of early uh, experiments, and then Apple ser you know, serves up the iPad, and overnight we have millions of users. Um, so, and I say that full transparency, they were our very first client. 
Um, so what do we do as, as producers of, of content? Um, how, do we, how do we deal with all the fact that our consumers are no longer um, you know, uh, simply consuming our shows in a predictable fashion? Um, you know, it's difficult enough, I think, to produce good television, and now we have all this technology that is, is um, a new obligation that we need to consider when we're thinking about how to put programming together and to reach audiences effectively and to sustain ourselves as, as producers. Um, and so we have really two approaches that I think are, are critical, and, and a third if I if I have the time to get to it. Um, but really, uh, this is, is sort of taking us a step from um, sort of a strategic mindset, which is to say, um, a lot of efforts um, in our industry and, and industries in general put huge amounts of time and energy, a lot of um, uh, you know committee meetings and strategic planning and focus groups into the design phase. Um, and you know this is important to a certain degree, but when things are changing as rapidly and that the acceleration of change is, is occurring at the pace that it is, um, it's really, really critical to actually get out there and, and see if your assumptions are true. Um, because we all are working off of assumptions. Um, even the technology companies are working off of assumptions. They have access to data that we don't, and they are still working off, of uh, off of assumptions. So the question is, we need to test this knowledge and see what is effective by having a design do process. And, and what's important is, obviously, as you're designing things, to stay very, you know, let's, let's set up a, a challenge for ourselves and say, we're going to try a second screen mobile app and then get right into it and do something that's lightweight. It doesn't take months and months and, and all of a sudden by the time it's available, there's a new platform and you know, we, don't, we don't have that time. We need to do something that's lightweight and easy. Maybe it's doing hashtag campaigns around next week's show, you know, um, using pre-existing technology. I mean, there's a lot of ways that you can get in the game and try to um, experiment with uh, you know, sort of some smart risk taking that enables you to gain learnings um, that you can then apply to your next experiment. And so I think that's the key here. It's not just to be running out there chaotically and doing everything, um, but it is to set up you know, very clear um, uh, objectives and to test your knowledge in a real world environment um, and then to apply that to the next, the next phase. And I, and I point to our partner, um, Apple, and these are actual prototypes that we're, we will never see, um, but when they released the iPhone, I think everyone thought what a, an unbelievable object, you know, it was designed well, it worked consistently, obviously there are criticisms as well, but, but you know, generally speaking, um, I think people thought it was an amazing development from a smartphone perspective and sort of, you know, re-envision what the user experience, what people wanted before they even knew what to ask for, what they wanted. Um, I remember coming back from the keynote where Steve um, unveiled it and I was getting on the plane and I took out of my bag my phone and my laptop where I was doing email and uh, my camera and I said, why are these three devices? And of course, he had just unveiled something that was all collapsed into one. And so, you know, there's genuine um, innovation that occurs from these insights, but they even did not know what was going to be most successful. They didn't know the form factor. They didn't know how large, how heavy, how fast, how hot, right? All these different things needed to be tested. Um, and so these will, like I said, be dead and buried in Cupertino, California, but uh, they are prototypes that were, were occurring behind the scenes. And so similarly, the main idea here is we all know that risk is difficult. None of us want to fail, right? But failure is part of, of the world that we live in right now. And, and I think to acknowledge that psychologically and within your organizations is, is critical. Um, but you can fail in smart ways um, and learn from those failures um, by lowering the stakes and increasing the odds of success, right? And so ultimately, not only are you going to go through a design do, uh, sort of exercise, but you want to have multiple designs and multiple doings. Um, so this is sort of the um, abstraction of, of the way my company works. And I think that um, for those, again, who are, who are innovating successfully, um, we certainly haven't figured everything out. But I think testing knowledge and assumptions to optimize your results is, is one of the most important sort of best practices. Additionally, knowing and communicating that you know, small failures and enduring those small fa failures while applying those learnings um, is important because it prevents big failures. Um, we all know about sort of catastrophic uh, moments where companies you know, uh, 
put all of their resources against one main idea um, and didn't test it out and didn't have um, any diversification of their of their risk. And I think that um, that's almost always a recipe for disaster. So um, while this may be challenging and may take you know more time and energy and sort of uh, mental bandwidth, um, as we call it, uh, I think it's it's the necessary uh, approach. Similarly, um, sort of a portfolio, having a portfolio of offerings is, is I think, another, another way to, to look at this idea of balancing your risk and, and preparing for disruptive change um, and emerging as one of those S-curve winners. Um, so uncertainty in terms of um, you know, both your internal capabilities is what this is measuring and in terms of the market readiness, right? So there are things that come up all the time, right? Before Facebook, there was Friendster and five other different social networks that MySpace Right, that everybody was very uh, obsessed with and thought, ah, oh, this is going to change everything. It will be here forever. We need to master this. Um, and you know, maybe the market wasn't ready for Facebook before it, it you know, it occurred and, and before uh, Mark, you know, kind of took a transition in his strategy in terms of deployment. Um, it certainly wasn't. And so, if you had been back then working on off of, uh, oh, Facebook is going to inherit the earth, um, and tried to, you know, put all of your resources towards that, that probably would be um, a very high uncertainty in terms of um, the amount of risk that you're enduring. So. Over there is uh, the market is not ready for it. And up here, you internally as a company are not ready for it. But these are, <laughs> these are two things that are, are generally um, uh, you know, important to, to balance and to look at as you're, uh, as you're thinking about where to put your resources and how many resources to put in terms of resource allocation. Um, so right here is a comfort zone. And this is linear television. And this is what we all know how to do, and we've been doing it. Um, and if it were continuing to grow and flourish and there was no disruption, we wouldn't need a conference like this, right? This could be a very simple graph and, and we'd all uh, sleep much better than I think we are sleeping right now. Um, but uh, again, as part of that whole S-curve analysis, if you look at different industries over time, what we find is um, companies that only have one bubble and stick here, that's who's going to lose in the, in the S-curve as time evolves because there's other companies that are taking bets, smart bets. Right? There's somebody who maybe, eh, we're not sure if the, red, if the world is ready or if we can advertise effectively or monetize our content um, profitably on YouTube, but let's try a YouTube channel. I'm going to put a low risk, a lo little bit amount of, uh, of uh, resources into a, a YouTube channel. We're going to try that. And maybe um, we can do it. Maybe we're, we can't. We don't know. This is sort of in the middle of the bubble of, of our internal capabilities and in the middle of the market readiness. So if you think about that, that might be one way to design and do as an opportunity. Similarly, you know, we know that um, uh, second screen apps in general are popular, but we're not sure if the market's ready for ours yet, if they want to see us on a mobile device. So let's say we also put it there, but we know we have a great developer in, in my company, and so we know there's no uncertainty in terms of whether or not we could build it. There's just some uncertainty in, in terms of whether or not our audience is looking for us on mobile. Um, and then an on-demand channel. You know, these are, are again, some, some ways to think about, um, way to to place your risk, way up there is 3D television, right? <laughs> Probably not ready today in terms of consumer appetite and, and ability to monetize it, and also probably not something that you can do very effectively with your internal capabilities and resources. Um, but you know, having a, a balanced portfolio like this with your, where you're putting different amounts of resource against a number of different platforms is a way to think about how you are uh, diversifying your um, your portfolio and increasing your chances of success. This increases your odds and lowers your stakes, right? So we have a design do approach, we have an opportunity matrix, and then we have data. Um, there is so much data <laughs> that is being generated by these platforms. It, it is completely overwhelming. And I think that for any of the companies that, e um, you know, we work with a lot of tech companies. Google's a big partner of ours. Um, and, you know, even they uh, cannot filter and effectively analyze all the data that they have access to. Um, you know, they do it much better than most companies. But I think that um, it's very, very difficult to take what is the raw data and synthesize it in, and analyze it into insights. Right? This is one of the biggest challenges that we face. And so 
I will take a stab at sharing with you um, one thing that we did last year, which we have a traditional video production operation and a, a, a social media practice as well, so that's the majority of my staff is video producers, editors, animators, um, not unlike many of yours, I'm sure. And then we also have social media experts. Um, and they work together, um, but what we were finding over time in this whole analysis of our portfolio was that um, companies and, and um, brands who were coming to us were looking for strategy. Um, they said, you know, we love the fact that you can produce content for our YouTube channel and for our website, for our mobile devices, for our, for our launches of new products, but we don't even know how we should be approaching this transition. We're canceling all of our display ads um, like that, and we don't know where we should be putting our, our, our new funding, um, and so we need a strategy. Um, I can't communicate this effectively to the executives at my company. I, I just want to run out there and produce more videos. We're spending millions on new videos, and nobody knows what to measure in terms of success. Um, and so what we said was, well, we need a strategic practice. If you're asking for strategy, then we need to be able to service you effectively. Um, and so we started to develop content strategy as its own unique service. Um, and what's interesting is uh, accessing this data is actually pretty exciting. Um, if you look at, you know, and, and by the way, it's very insightful in terms of helping to determine if you're thinking about um, competitive advantage and wanting to reach your audience in a relevant way, um, helping to determine how you go about producing content, not from a technology standpoint, but from a storytelling standpoint, how you go about producing that content in a way that's going to be very relevant and effective to the audience, um, so that it's both shareable and discoverable, as we looked at in the opening video. So with our strategic practice, um, we developed this um, sort of green light scorecard. The idea of green lighting a, a, a script in Hollywood is, is you know, we're now going to be in production. We're stopping development. We're starting production. Um, and so similarly, we have a green light scorecard here that is guiding what we originate as our own shows. Um, and part of that is about content authenticity. Um, and so, you know, this is really being... Um, uh, using, again, different sources of data. We have clout and peer index, which guide um, people's uh, level of influence on, on different social platforms. There's different social networks that score individuals and topics, and then um, brand sentiment and open slate, which are two different sort of YouTube analysis tools that are open to the public and free. Um, and so we use these as a way to guide um, whether or not our stars and our topic have a significant digital presence, whether or not people are looking for that content to begin with, um, and what the role is in the, in the program. Um, the brand permission from the audience, so sometimes we have to partner as we do. Um, right now we have major broadcasters that we partner with on certain topics and they are known for a certain type of content and we gain authenticity um, by virtue of that partnership. Um, and then having a high open slate score. And open slate, again, like I said, they, they are scraping YouTube's data and measuring engagement, influence, and reach. So the other part of the score is about the audience. Um, so we look at the content subject, and then we look at the audience, and we say, is this a well-defined audience? Um, you know, generally speaking, mass does not work online, right? If you're, if you're reaching every 14-year-old boy, this is, not a, this is not a demographic segment. You have to be much more thoughtful about the niches um, and understand behavior in order to uh, really tap into, you know, make a viral video. That's what, that's what ultimately this, this green light scorecard will do. It'll, it'll um, increase your chances of having this content be discovered and increases your chances of the, having the content be shared. Um, so similarly, we then, we then think about distribution. Is this something that, you know, there's a new um, army of distributors that are arising in, in the, in, uh, across the globe, really, but this is it's no longer just YouTube. It's, it's AOL, it's MSN, it's Xbox, um, it's Yahoo, it's Sony Crackle. Um, these are all sort of brand new players, and, and they, are, they are buying content in droves, um, quality content. And while there is, um, you know, a, a very... Uh, uh, sort of, I would say, rigid um, set of criteria in terms of the types of shows they buy. Um, it is changing on a regular basis and getting broader and broader. So in terms of, um, you know, your interest as a producer of content to, to work with them, I would say, you know, continue to have those discussions because um, there's, there's more and more funding becoming available all the time. So from distribution, we have a lot of partners in this arena um, that we work with on an ongoing basis. And, uh, you know, we want to work with um, both them directly and with our agent and with our um, legal team to make sure that this is um, a, a viable distribution outlet. 
want to make sure that we have the rights, all those good things. Um, and then multi-platform format, multi-format plan. So, you know, obviously having everything based on, again, the whole eggs in one basket idea, right? We don't want to just produce something for YouTube if we have the permission to produce, produce it for other platforms as well, right? It's just like saying, we're only going to make a feature film for theaters and we're not going to ever think about putting it on DVD or, or on demand. Um, so, you know, between these four sort of pieces of criteria, um, we score different ideas. So when when company when um, you know producers outside of our organization or within the company come to us, um, we think about all the different sort of data points and um, sources of data where we can analyze this stuff objectively. Um, and I'm not saying that content is is produced at my company um, in this automatic sort of algorithmic way, um, but there are a million different permutations and choices when you make a, when you tell a story. Um, and I think that the more you have some basis for quantitative analysis in addition to your own taste making, your own experience, your own sort of subjective ability to um, engage audiences in an entertaining way, balancing out subjectivity and objectivity is, is uh, our recommendation. Um, and so with that, I'll show you one piece that we, if we have time, um, just very, very quickly to, f to finish, um, where the, let's see, um, Microsoft came to us last year. This is a brand that we work with a lot. Um, and um, Internet Explorer is one of the most um, despised products in the technology industry, at least in the, in the US. Um, and they're well aware of this. They've, they've done their own brand studies. We didn't need to tell them this. Um, but when they were coming out with their new browser, they said, you know, it's going to be very sad for us because we're going to we finally addressed so many of the issues that a lot of the technology uh, influencers have been criticizing us for y for years. And so um, they set up a website called um, the browser you love to hate, um, which was the first uh, <laughs> sort of attempt at risk. Um, and they launched it, and it was you know it caught on for a little bit in terms of the the community. Um, but you know when we work with them, we said, listen, this is a perfect opportunity for uh, a video. So can we? you know, really think about the audience. Can we approach it from a strategic perspective? Can we, can we do some of the green light scorecard analysis? Um, we have this new strategic practice. This is a good opportunity to try it out. Um, and this is, this is what the result was. What happens when you take some risks? <laughs> um, so just in closing, I'll say, you know, I, I, uh, I know this is an uncomfortable period for all of us, but I, I hope that, uh, you know, you take a chance and encourage your own producers and companies to take a chance because I think that, uh, you know, there is tremendous payoff when, when you can get all parties to, uh, you know, think a little bit more broadly, embrace risk in smart ways, and, and go forward into the wild west. So thank you. <laughs>